And Lord, it really is so that the greatest thing we can do while we're still here on earth is worship you. And Lord, we, we don't take that lightly. We don't just treat this as a little time of singing. But we really want to be taken deeper and deeper and deeper into the truth and the reality of worshiping you. And this morning, Lord, let it be that we really do worship you. Don't just sing a bit of stuff, but that in our hearts we really lift up and exalt and glorify your name and who you are. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.
of the sleeves He had just put on the ribs Thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his face. Our God is an awesome God. And the world wasn't joking when he came him out of Eden. Wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, so you better be believing. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with him. Father, we do really ask that you would bring revelation and clear revelation to our hearts this morning. That this is not just a, a time of preaching and sharing, but that you really would reveal and unveil and show. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. If we could go to Matthew 16. From verse 13 through to 19. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. The bridge from religion to relationship is the bridge of revelation. The bridge from religion to a real relationship is revelation. The only bridge that carries you from the emptiness of religion and legalism into the richness and the reality of a living relationship with God is revelation. So Peter says, you're not just a nice man or a wise man or a prophet. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, this understanding didn't come to you through flesh and blood. In other words, it didn't come by natural means. But it came by revelation. Apocalypto. Apocalypto. Obviously, the word from which we get the word apocalypse. When most of us think of that word apocalypse, we think of the end of the world and death and destruction and all sorts of horrible things happening. But what that word apocalypto means is to take the cover off, to lift the lid on something and to reveal something, to remove the veil. That's all that it means. Peter Flesh and blood didn't lift the lid off for you, but my Father in heaven did it. So what does revelation mean? It means very, very simply that the veil that separates the natural and the supernatural, the veil between the physical and the spiritual, the finite and the infinite, the temporary and the eternal, is pulled aside and you see what cannot be seen with a natural eye, you hear with supernatural hearing, you understand what cannot be understood with a natural mind. That's revelation. So Jesus says to Peter, you're blessed because this hasn't come by learning and by natural means, but it came by revelation from the Father in heaven and you will no longer be called Simon but Petros, a little rock. And upon this Petra, this huge rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. What rock is Jesus building his church upon? Upon this little pebble, this little stone called Peter. The Catholics want us to believe that Peter was the first pope and that the Lord built his whole church on Peter. Absolute rubbish. He's saying, I will build my church upon this huge rock of the revelation that I am the Christ, the only Son of the only God. And there is nothing in heaven and in hell that will ever be able to stand in the face of a church, a people, a man, or a woman who walks in that revelation. Nothing will prevail against that revelation. Peter, you've crossed over the bridge from religion into relationship. And how did it happen? It happened through revelation. Jesus doesn't congratulate Peter for figuring this out by having spent five years in Bible college. And Jesus, amazingly, isn't even excited by the fact that Peter now knows that he is the Christ. He's excited about the way Peter came to know it. That's what excites him. It came by revelation from my Father to you. That's what excites him. And now, Peter, because you have this revelation, because you have this revelation, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and so on. So to whom is this great authority given? To those who truly have not the understanding, the mental agreement, the knowledge, but to those who have the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Revelation is the bridge that takes you into a real relationship. And all the power, the authority, and the blessing that goes along with that relationship. It's the bridge that crosses the great divide between I never knew you, welcome, friend of God. Revelation. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about, wasn't it? It was people coming out of the upper room, not with armfuls of notes from a conference that they'd attended, or worse still, armfuls of DVDs and books that they'd bought at the conference. They came out of that room in the power of having seen, having had a revelation of who the Lord Jesus Christ truly is. These are people who'd spent three and a half years with Him, but they come out of that room with this revelation of who He really is. They'd been men moving in the shadows. They'd been groping around for those three and a half years in uncertainty, always questioning things, doubting, wondering. But now the veil had been pulled aside, the blaze of heaven had broken through, and they saw. And they really saw. It was in the full blaze of revelation that the church was born. The Holy Spirit breaking open, revealing to men who Jesus really is. It was in the light of that revelation that they then became witnesses. It was in the light of that revelation that the church was born. It was in the light of that revelation that the church then grew and spread to the whole known world at that time. Just simply the revelation of who Jesus really is. Christianity was never meant to be a religion. It was always purposed to be an ever-growing relationship. And the only way into that relationship is through an ever-growing revelation of Jesus Christ. And we need to realize that there, there is really only one revelation that runs from Genesis through to uh, Revelation. There is only one revelation. And that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. From the one who was there right at the beginning, the promised one of Genesis 3, who would crush the head of the serpent, right through to the one who in the very second to last verse of the Bible says, I'm coming soon. It's all an unfolding revelation of Jesus. Somebody might say, well, God has given me a revelation of this or of that. But if it's not pointing to, magnifying, glorifying Jesus Christ, it's not revelation. It may be wisdom, it may be understanding, it may be insight, but it's not revelation. Jesus Christ is the only thing God reveals to us. Colossians 2.3, Christ in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not 99.9%, but in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2.9, for in him all of the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Again, all of it. God doesn't give us a revelation of a thousand, a hundred, or even ten different things. He gives us a revelation of the one who is all in all, who is right now in the process of filling all things, and in whom all things exist. Christ has, uh, sorry, God has placed all things within Jesus Christ, and so all He does is reveal Christ to us. He will not reveal anything to us apart from the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord won't manifest or reveal Himself to the world at large because they will not love and will not receive Him. John 14, 21 to 23. He's purposely hidden the knowledge of Jesus Christ and will only give it by way of revelation to those who humble themselves as little children. Luke 10, 21 to 24 at that very time, he rejoiced greatly 
in the Holy Spirit. Again, why is Jesus rejoicing? And said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent. And why is he rejoicing? Because you have revealed, you've unveiled them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way, this way of revealing to humble people was well-pleasing in your sight. You see Jesus getting excited again over the fact that the Father is revealing. All things have been given to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to his disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see, again, not by natural sight, but to see by revelation the things which you see, and they did not see them. And to hear the things which you hear, and they did not hear them. There's a huge difference between learning and seeing. Not blessed are the minds that have studied and learned, but blessed are the eyes that see. And please, please, please remember this. The whole purpose of all prophetic writing and speaking is to bring further revelation of Jesus Christ to the church and to the world. So much of what is called prophecy in the church today is just cheap, fortune telling. You can go to the royal show and pay a granny there at the, with her caravan. You can pay her 50 bucks and you'll get exactly the same thing. No different whatsoever. Please bear it in mind that every single prophetic utterance in scripture and out of scripture, if you even want to, always, always, always is pointing to Jesus Christ and nothing else. Run from everything else that is pointing in any other direction, telling you how wonderful you are, you're going to have an international ministry, God does this and God is going to do that and whatever, run from it. One of the translations of Revelation 19.10 puts it like this, it is the truth concerning Jesus that inspires all prophecy. It is the truth concerning Jesus that is the inspiration behind all prophecy. The very first words that John writes in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, are not, this is the revelation, um, this is the lifting of the lid on the end times and of everything that's going to happen. But he says right from the very beginning, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is not now the same Jesus, the one upon whom, uh, whose breast John rested, the one who Jesus loved, and, and he came and laid his head on him. But this, John says, is the revealing of Jesus Christ, now King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the Lion, the Lamb, the Beginning, the End, the First, the Last, the Living One who is coming back. Very, very, very soon, he says. The living one who is right now gathering his bride, building his church with living stones. And those living stones are simply the ones who've had the same revelation that Peter had. You are the Christ, the only son of the only God. You see, Saul of Tarsus, he believes he's walking in revelation. He's walking in the revelation and, and he believes that Jesus Christ was a fraud and a liar. But he's met with this bright light on the road to Damascus. That veil between the physical and the spiritual is pulled aside. And the light is so bright that it blinds his natural eyes. But in an instant his spiritual eyes are opened and he sees. He sees Jesus Christ finally for who he really is. That's revelation. 
Paul was able to, to later declare that the gospel he preached didn't come to him by natural means. It all came to him by revelation. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. In other words, as, as was the case with Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to me. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Not I received this gospel by revelation from Jesus. I didn't receive it by getting revelation from Jesus. But I received this gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ. What an amazing statement. I got the gospel through getting a revelation of Jesus. Three words of true revelation are worth three million words that you get through natural means. Really, really, really. One microsecond of revelation is more valuable than tens of thousands of hours of listening to some guy like me stand up and try and teach you stuff. And the Lord would say this morning, examine your foundations. Let the Spirit of God search us. What have you got? Religion or relationship? And the thing that separates those two, the thing that transports you from one to the other, is only a revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing else will get you there. How many of us here this morning are able to say with Paul, I did not confer with flesh and blood. I only speak to you that which has come to me by way of revelation. A revelation of Jesus is more than enough. Flesh and blood can't add to or take away that which has come to you by revelation. There's a world of difference between repeating what you've heard and speaking about what you saw when the veil was pulled aside, when the lid was taken off. And you saw beyond the natural and the temporary and the physical. And a revelation of Jesus Christ will touch and change every single part of your life. It really, really will. And you can only have true lasting, enduring faith for that which has come to you by means of revelation. You can only stand this morning and endure and last forever in faith in that which has come to you by revelation. You can go for years and years with a head knowledge of divine healing. You can even be in full agreement with the truth that God does and, and He still does heal people. But then one day the veil is pulled aside and you see those deep and cruel scars in the back of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And you suddenly you know that you know that you know that by those stripes, that by those very stripes, you have been healed. Maybe not always physically, but spiritually, emotionally, eternally. And the truth then migrates from here to here. And suddenly, you're walking in revelation. You can walk for years and years with an understanding of the cross. You can like to talk about the cross. You can wear a cross around your neck. But then one day you're struck dumb by a revelation of that precious, powerful blood spilled just for me. And suddenly you elevate it out of the ordinary into a supernatural revelation of what it truly means to be forgiven. I am forgiven because of that. I'm forgiven because of what I've seen. And when you truly walk in that revelation that I have been forgiven and of just how much I have been forgiven of, 
then and only then can you truly walk in complete forgiveness towards other people. It's only when you have had that revelation of the magnitude of what you've been forgiven that you then really are able to walk in forgiveness towards others. A young man called Stephen gets a revelation of Jesus and look what happens. Acts 7, 55 through to 60. Being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up. The veil has been pulled aside. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice. They covered their ears. They rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man called Saul, later to become Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Because of that revelation, the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, the heavens opened, Stephen is able to willingly go to a horrific death. And not just enduring it and hanging into the bitter end, but he's able to cry out with a loud voice right at the end, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Flesh and blood cannot do that. Revelation will. And I want to say to you in absolute love this morning that if you find worship boring, if you're unable to really enter into worship, you have not yet received a revelation of Jesus Christ. Because you, when you have truly seen Him as He is, you will want any opportunity you have to worship, to exalt, to adore, to honor, and magnify Him. The very simple reason why those living creatures and the elders are right at this moment, even as we're here this morning, right now before the throne of God, they're just there crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. The only reason they're doing that night and day is simply because of that revelation. They have seen Him as He is. And that causes them just to worship and to worship and to worship. And a lot of other things like fear, doubt, double-mindedness, greed, lust, jealousy, bitterness, unbelief. They're just symptoms of the same cause. We have not yet had a full revelation of Jesus Christ. We have not yet fully seen Him for who He is. And there are a lot of things in the church today that are not blatantly evil or sinful. Many programs and systems. Some of them that originally even came out of a revelation God gave to somebody once. But the problem is, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, all these things lead your mind astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Good things. As I say, some that even flowed out of a revelation initially. But Paul says, be careful of things that come and lead you away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. Some years ago, I read about a church in America that asked if one of the prominent preachers could come and speak at their conference. And the minister's secretary emailed them back with a list of requirements that had to be met in order for this man to come. Those demands included a five-figure honorarium. So in rand terms, that means a minimum of 170,000 rands for one sermon. Five figures in American dollars, a minimum of 170,000 rands. 
a 70,000 rand deposit for fuel for the private jet, a manicurist and a hairstylist for the speaker, a suite in a five-star hotel, a luxury car from the airport to the hotel, and room temperature Perrier water. Had to be room, not cold stuff. There was a time when that kind of behavior would have made me all indignant and angry, but today it just fills me with a deep, deep sadness. And the overwhelming conviction that those men, men like that, cannot, have not yet had a revelation of who Jesus Christ really is. And I really want to urge you this morning, stop asking the Lord for things. Really, really stop asking the Lord for things. The stuff you think you need. The trinkets and the toys you desire and you want to have. Stop asking the Lord for more power and anointing and gifts and position and whatever. But just really have the courage to start asking Him for a bigger, greater revelation of Jesus Christ. What did Paul urge us to look for? He didn't say look for healing, look for a slightly better life, or like Joel Osteen promised, Paul didn't say, look for your best life now. But he says in Titus 2, 13 and 14, we're looking. We're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing and the epiphany, the great unveiling. This is what we're looking for, the unveiling of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. It takes great determination and great courage to leave behind all those many things and to seek the one thing. But God would urge you, press in, seek, Desire above everything else a richer, greater revelation of Jesus Christ. Leave behind the many things for the sake of an overwhelming revelation of the one through whom, sorry, from whom, through whom, to whom all things exist. If you have a revelation of Jesus Christ, you really don't need anything else. If you don't have a revelation of Jesus Christ, nothing else makes a difference anyway. Ephesians 1, 16 to 21. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, this is Paul's prayer, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of what? All sorts of stuff? No. May give you revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart, not your physical eyes, but the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will then know once you've had that revelation, you will know the hope of His calling. What are the riches of His glory, of the inheritance of His inheritance in the saints? What is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ, when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but in the one to come. Revelation, the bridge from religion to relationship. Blessed are you, Peter. This understanding didn't come to you by natural, man-made, flesh and blood means. It came to you by revelation. 
And on this huge, immovable rock of the revelation of Jesus Christ, I will build something that will stand for eternity. Amen. Stand, or you can sit, or stand, or whatever, and pray. Now, I really want to pray for us all this morning. And you need to also do that in your own hearts, that, that Lord, we would have the boldness, we would have the audacity, to lay aside the many things. And Lord, so often those things shout so loudly. They're so demanding. Look at me. Pay attention to me. Do something about me. But God, that you would give us the hearts this morning that truly can lay aside those many things and seek the one thing. That Lord, we would truly, with all of our hearts, press into you. Keep knocking on your door like that widow. And not give up and say, God, give me a deeper revelation of Jesus Christ. God, even in this week, give me a revelation of Jesus Christ that I've never known before. And Lord, that as you do that, other things can fall into their correct place behind that great truth, that great revelation. That, O oh God, we may see Jesus as He is. Thank you. Amen.